Good morning. Good morning. It's great. That was, a, that was an amazing song to, to proceed this message. So sometimes when I'm working on my sermons, um, the first thing that pops into my head after I've, I've studied the, the passage is the introduction, the way I'm going to move us into the Word of God. This is not, was not one of those. I sat there looking at my, my computer screen, well, first my piece of paper, and I did, okay, well, let me just continue on. I'll, I'll get through all the points of, of this passage and see what God is saying. And, and then, then I'll know the way to in, enter it. And that, then it happened. And woke up this morning and I told my wife, I said, sermon's done, but I still don't have an intro. So well, that's okay. I still have a, a little time to work on this. And it's on the way over here that, that I realized how to, how to lead into this passage. And then, then we sang that song, and I didn't feel the need to anymore. <laughs> because as we go into the book of John, John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34 is where we're going to be. So the gospel of John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. I started thinking about it on the way over here, and, and I realized this is, this is the intro. Because all of us have had news that we wanted to tell somebody, right? A surprise birthday coming up, and you just, you want to tell that person so bad. Or a friend is, is going to be having a baby, and, and you know, but no one else does. And, and they said, no, you have to wait a certain amount of time before we can say anything. And like, it's just brimming up inside of you. Maybe you, you got a new job, but you have to wait for that that start date before you, you put it out on social media or you jump up on the top of your roof and just scream it for the whole neighborhood to hear. But we all have that at some point in our life where we just have to tell somebody. And that's what we're getting into right here. And that song led in perfectly because that's basically what the gospel writer says. He says, let me tell you about my Jesus. Our passage today is John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. And it says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word, God, I, I pray, Lord, that we'll have open hearts and minds, that, Lord, we will... Leave this service today, Lord, better understanding you and on fire, Lord, to tell other people about my Jesus. Pray all of this in your son's holy name. Amen. When you have that news, you just have to tell. Now, we know from where we've uh, been through in the book of John already that the delegation sent by the Jewish leaders have, has just left. They've, they've gone back to Jerusalem to let the, 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 the Jewish religious leaders know, John, not the Messiah, not the prophet, not, not Elijah, he says he's a messenger. Now, in words very similar to how Mark writes his gospel. 
here John tells us that this happens, like, Mark will often say, like, immediately. And then immediately this happened, trying to push the story along. And John here is doing that. He says, the next day. So after, after this revelation, the next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him. The next day, probably while John the Baptist was preaching and baptizing, he sees this figure walking toward him. And he cries out, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, this statement would have resonated with his disciples. And honestly, with a lot of the crowd gathered around. But for us today, I'm, I'm sure that while this statement is amazing, the Lamb of God, we're set centuries apart from the sacrificial system. I don't know, I, I think it, it loses something sometimes. Some of that impact. But to John, to the people that, that was, were around him, they couldn't forget. There was a daily reminder every time they walked past the temple, the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice, the Day of Atonement, the feasts, all centered around the shedding of blood. Sacrifices were being performed. The smell of the burnt offering. They, they would hear the prayers seeking forgiveness rising through the air. We see that it was just after the fall in Genesis 3 when God does the first sacrifice. Adam and Eve have sinned. In their shame, they realize that, that they are naked and, and they're hiding from God. And God covers their shame by making clothes of skin. The sacrifice of an animal to pay the debt that Adam and Eve had incurred. This is the first example that because of sin, there is death. In Genesis 4, we see Cain and Abel offering sacrifices to God. Now, Abel, who was a shepherd, had brought a lamb, a spotless lamb, and offered it as his sacrifice. But Cain, Cain was a farmer. And Cain had brought some produce. Now, it, it was his best produce. It was the first of his produce. But it wasn't what God had asked for. They both had, bought, had brought their best, but only one brought what God had asked for. And we all know how that ended. As God told Cain that he had not brought the required offering. So from the opening pages of the Bible we see that the payment for sin, that the sin offering was a lamb, a perfect and spotless lamb. Behold the lamb of God. The, the people's minds would have gone back to, to the father of, of their, their nation, to Abraham. And if you turn to Genesis 22, we can see the story of Isaac, the promised miracle son of, of Abraham and Sarah, the son they had to wait almost a century to have. See, the story actually starts in Genesis 21, where God tells us how Abraham and, and Sarah had remained childless for a century until God visited them and, as promised, the miracle child, Isaac, was born. What great joy! What a blessing that was. Abraham knew the promise. God had told him, through your son, I will make a great nation. A nation that will be larger than the, the stars in the sky, the sands on the sea. A people, God said, he would create for himself. And through these people, through that nation, 
the world would be blessed. But something happens in Genesis 22. And it's something that, that as we're reading this story, we don't expect. The Lord seeks to test Abraham. So he commands him, you need to go up to this mountain and offer a sacrifice. Well, this is nothing new. God says, and the sacrifice will be your one and only son, Isaac. Abraham, trusting God. The book of Hebrews says that Abraham trusted God to the extent that he, he said, even if my son dies, God will raise him again. Abraham trusted the word of God. So during the trek, Abraham leaves the servants and he takes Isaac and he places the wood on his back and they start walking up the mountain. And somewhere on this journey up the mountain, Isaac looks around and, and he asks his father something. Father, where is the lamb? Abraham responds, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And while I love that translation, there's so many times where in the Old Testament we get a, a new name of God, and here's one of them. The translation, Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. Amazing. I love, great translation, but it loses just a little something from the Hebrew. You have to remember that when we take words from one language, um, especially one from roughly 4,000 years ago, and try to put it into English, sometimes we lose a little nuance. Now, nothing here is going to change all that much. But a more literal translation is this. God will see to the lamb for the sacrifice himself, my son. God will see to it. The God who sees to it. As Abraham climbs the mountain of the Lord, his long-awaited son, whom he had been asked to sacrifice, asks him where the sacrifice is. And Abraham, Abraham tells him, God will see to it. And eventually, Abraham and Isaac reach their destination. Abraham binds his son, places him on the wood on the altar, raises the knife and prepares to deal the death blow when he is stopped by an audible voice from heaven telling him not to harm the boy. The angel of the Lord gives a divine command for his obedience and then reveals a ram stuck in the thicket. Abraham passed the test that was mentioned in Genesis 22.1. The boy is safe. And as Abraham had mentioned, God saw to the offering himself. This new experience between, between the Lord and Abraham resulted in a new adjective being attached to the name of the Lord. Jehovah Jireh, the God who sees to it. The Lord will see to it. And it says, and Abraham called the place, the Lord will see to it. Which it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, it will be seen to. It will be provided. Look. Look. The lamb. This encounter was mere days from the Passover when, pe when the people of Israel gathered to remember when God had passed over them in, in Egypt. We can look in, in Exodus 12, the last of the ten plagues, and we find this account where God commanded that they must select a lamb, 
one without spot and blemish, and after killing it, they must take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel over the door of the house where they eat. And God said in verse 12, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt both people and animals. I am the Lord. I will execute judgment against the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Here we have John. Behold the lamb. You see, we can go to Isaiah 53 and we can see the promised Messiah who would be afflicted and oppressed, but like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before her shears, he did not open his mouth. We could go on and on as a sacrificial system was meant to point to the coming Messiah. I mean, from the opening pages of Scripture, when God promised to send the Savior, when he promised, he said, I, I will send one to defeat the serpent. To the closing verses of Revelation, we see the Lamb. And John cries out, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This wasn't just any Lamb. Since the Lambs the people selected were just stand-ins. Each person, each family had to bring a lamb for themselves, and they had to do this year after year. When we look at it, we see that John uses the present tense here. The lamb who, who takes away. This is remarkable because by all the best commentators, both ancient and modern, this is intended to show the completeness of Christ's satisfaction for sin. And that the continual application of his once made sacrifice, he is always taking away sin. One commentator, Robert Rolock, who lived in the 1500s of reserves, and he says, the influence of Christ's sacrifice is perpetual and his blood never dries up. Let us not overlook the fact that the singular number is used here when it's regarding sin. It is the sin, not the sins. These words purposefully intend to show that what Christ took away, what he bore on the cross, was was not the sin of certain people only, but the whole accumulated mass of all the sins of all the children of Adam. He bore the weight of them all, and he made an atonement sufficient to make satisfaction for all. What good news. What amazing truth. And this should give us hope and comfort because there's no one who is too lost, no sin too great, no person beyond the love of God who sent his one and only son to die for the sins of the world. So I want to challenge each of us to view Jesus just as John the Baptist represents him here. So while we must serve him faithfully as our master, and, and we, we must obey him as our king, and we should, we should emulate him as our example. We must, as J.C. Ryle said, we must, above all, prize him as our sacrifice and the rest and rest our whole weight on his death as an atonement for sin. Let his blood be more precious in our eyes every year we live. We know nothing rightly about Christ until we see him with John the Baptist's eyes and can rejoice in him as the lamb that was slain. I'm sure you now see why John the Baptist had to shout, look, 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as great as Jesus being the Lamb of God is, we see a promise in the next few verses. Christ is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Our second point is Christ will baptize with the Holy Spirit. We see here in, verses, in verse 31, John the Baptist says, I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. And then John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Very little is known about the baptism of Jesus. And here in the book of John, it's not even covered. But when we look at the, the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we do get a little bit of information on the baptism of Jesus. What we can see, though, from, all, from those three accounts, is that when Jesus was baptized, immediately the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Baptized, off into the wilderness for 40 days of temptation. So, when John says this, behold the Lamb of God, this would have been roughly 40 plus days after Jesus' baptism. John had already seen the Spirit descend. John, in that moment, knew. He knew who this man was. And he had had to keep it to himself, at least for a little while. Here we have John thinking back to just over 40 days ago when he was approached by a man, Jesus, who John may not have actually known all that well. Now, I know our, our brain says, wait, weren't they related? Well, yes, but I have distant cousins I don't know. So... I'm just going to have to go with the text here. John said he didn't know him. Um, I'm going to go with that. Now, he probably had heard stories from his mom. Hey, there is this time when a distant relative came to visit, and when she walked in, she was pregnant, I was pregnant, and you, like, kicked really hard, and we think that's the Messiah. And John is probably like, or you put too much salsa on your food? I have no idea. But here we have John. Now he knows. Because when John baptized Jesus, he saw. And the same one God, the Father, who had sent John to baptize with water, had told him what to look for. He said, you will see the Messiah. And this is how you're going to know who he is. So when John baptized Jesus and saw the Holy Spirit come down like a dove and rest upon Jesus, I'm, I'm sure he remembered the prophecy from Isaiah 11, which says, Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. You see, the spirit of the Lord will rest on the Messiah. John knew that his baptism with water was ultimately not what the people needed. He was there to prepare the way, but the baptism of the Spirit on all those who place their faith in Christ. That's what we're waiting for. The reference to the baptism of the Holy Spirit here points toward Pentecost and beyond. Acts chapter 2 lets us know 
that early Christians, including the, the apostles, were baptized with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But now, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. Every believer is baptized in the Spirit at the moment of conversion. So let us ask ourselves, as we, we leave this passage, whether we are baptized with the Spirit or whether we have any real interest in the Lamb of God. Countless Christians are, are wasting their time arguing politics and gun rights and what color the carpet should be, what the best car is. Should we have a beer or should we not? Who is more right? Wasting their time. But should we... But we should not neglect the baptism of the Holy, the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the heart. See, we have people now who, who are content with a head knowledge of the Lamb of God, but they've never sought him by faith. They've never sought him so that their own sin may actually be taken away. So today we need to examine our lives and see if we count ourselves as ones who have a new heart. Do we believe in Christ to the saving of our souls? Our point, point three is Christ is the chosen one. Verse 34 says, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Now, I love watching courtroom dramas. TV lawyers always seem to have just the right thing to say at the right moment. They, craft, craft, they craftfully make their closing statements. They lead witnesses to tell the truth. They expose lies. And then with a dramatic flair, they bring out the truth. You want the truth? You can't handle the truth. <laughs> and you're like, oh, yes! Just like that. It, Except I've spent my fair share of time in courtrooms, most of it on the right side of the, the bench. <laughs> and it doesn't happen like that very often. It's usually pretty routine, pretty boring. But I still love testifying in court. I had fun with it. My, my uncle spent 32 years as a homicide detective in Harris County, Texas, so Houston, so pretty busy area. And he would always tell me about little tricks he would do when testifying, mainly to aggravate the defense attorney. <laughs> and I learned how to testify. I learned how to, how to explain what had happened, what I had seen, what I had heard, how to put all the pieces together so that the judge and the jury could understand, well, this is why Yoki charged these people, this person, with this crime. I probably shouldn't have, but I, I always viewed the, the district attorney as like my best friend and the defense attorney as someone who was going to push me down the stairs later. And that would come through sometimes in how I would answer their questions. I would be very polite with the, defense, with the uh, district attorney. And I'd be very short with the defense attorney. <laughs> I would make them, I wanted volunteer information. Because I knew their, their job was to make me look less intelligent, which isn't hard to do. So, <laughs> so I would I'd only give them the exact answer. And I'd make them draw out of me. I'd make them pull it out. And, but I'd, I, I, 
I would do this because I wanted the truth to come out. I wanted people to see this person did this thing, which is, which is why we need this result. John the Baptist, here, he, he wasn't sitting in the courtroom. But I, I don't want you to think that his testimony is anything less than that. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. This, this is where John was at. John was standing in front of his a group of people, a large crowd. We know that people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and the, the surrounding countryside of the Jordan River were flocking to him to be baptized by him. Baptism for the repentance of sins. Baptism that paved the way for the Messiah. And John needed to let them know something. He needed to let them know that that he was telling the truth. And that's what this word testify. In the, in the Greek, that's the tone it carries. It's not I told someone. Oh yeah, I told someone that it's a warm day outside. This is a legal term. A term that carries weight. What I am saying carries weight. You, you need to listen to this. Not only do you need to listen to it, jury's going to be out on it. So after I say it, you need to think about it you need to, to look around. You need to do some research, and you need to decide, can I be trusted? This is where John is right now. Now, there, there are some, some textual variants in verse 34. Some areas where, where biblical scholars disagree on kind of what the translation should be. But it's more than likely that the original manuscripts read that I have seen and testified that this is the chosen one of God. Now, we think about it, and in the first 29 verses, John made a pretty strong case that Jesus was the Son of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word is with God. Like, he, he spends some time, as we have, hammering this point home. And knowing how important it was to translate Scripture accurately, and knowing how these scribes would, would, never, would never take the name of, of God and replace it with something else. It leads me to believe, and again, it doesn't change anything here on this text, but it leads me to believe that the change happened from this is the chosen one of God and going with the theme of the book of John, <laughs> and the theme of the book of John is Jesus, God, the Son incarnate. This is, this is Jesus. This is the testimony. Believe in him that you may be saved more than likely that he got changed to the Son of God. But John was more than likely thinking back to Isaiah 42.1, where the prophet tells us about the promised Messiah. He says, this is my servant, I strengthened him. This is my chosen one. I delight in him. I've put my spirit on him. And he will bring justice to the nations. God chose Jesus to be the Messiah before the foundations of the earth. Paul goes on about this in Ephesians 1. Where he's writing this letter to, to believers, to those who have placed their faith in in Christ, and he tells believers, he's like, hey, all of you have placed your faith in the chosen one? 
we've been, we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Jesus Christ, the chosen one of God. How is salvation going to be brought? Is it through a lamb sacrifice morning and evening? Is it through the day of atonement? Is it observing the Passover? No. As Paul says in Ephesians 1, there's a chosen one. Jesus Christ. And the forgiveness of our trespasses, they're found in him. The riches of his grace, found in him. The redemption of our bodies, is found in the chosen one. What is your testimony? As we conclude today, I want you to think about that. What is your testimony? We are going to have you sit up here on the stand. And in the few places in the United States that still do it, put your hand on the Bible. What is your testimony going to be? Do you hold that Christ is the Lamb of God? That Christ is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. That Christ is the chosen one of God. Let me tell you about my Jesus. If you believe that, how do you not? How do you not Tell people about your Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Today, as we sing, I want to invite you, if you have not placed your faith in the chosen one of God, it's not too late. You may think, my sins are too big. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've done. I'm hopeless. Let me tell you. The Lamb of God has come. And he took away the sin of the world. So today, if that applies to you, I invite you. I'm going to be standing here at the front. Come down. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to pray with you. Maybe you just need, need prayer in general. I'm going to be here. Maybe as we sing... You just need to confess to, to God. You say, God, I believe that by lip service, but I don't tell people. Give me the strength I need to testify, to tell people about my Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray, God, that you will give us the courage that we need, that you will strengthen us, that you will convict us, God, that every time we open your word, we will not be able to help but say, look, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you, God, for sending your one and only Son, not withholding anything, so that while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of you, you took away the sin of the world. It's in his name we pray.